Hello and welcome to the Minds on the Frontline podcast, brought to you by the Frontline Strong Together 5 program. FST5 provides streamlined access to behavioral and mental health services, as well as crisis resources for Michigan's Frontline 5 workers and their families. This includes all professional, part-time and volunteer, firefighters, EMS, law enforcement, corrections officers, and 911 dispatchers in Michigan and their immediate family members. First responders and mental health experts collaboratively created FST5 to provide 24-7 live support, effective resources, and cutting-edge services to prevent and alleviate PTSD, anxiety, depression, and other frontline work-related mental and behavioral health challenges. Need help now? If you are a frontline worker in Michigan or an immediate family member experiencing any crisis, work-related, substance abuse, depression, relationships, finances, or any other, reach out by calling 1-833-34-STRONG or go to fst5.org for more information. I'm Jeff Lassers, one of the hosts of the Minds on the Frontline podcast. And I am a professional firefighter, paramedic, educator, and content creator. Minds on the Front Line is co-hosted by Mike Mattern, who is also a professional firefighter and paramedic. In addition, Mike is a peer support team member for his fire department and the Frontline Strong Together 5 program, as well as the chair of the Michigan Professional Firefighters Union Behavioral Health Committee and a board member of the Michigan Crisis Response Association. Mike has training and experience with frontline worker mental and behavioral health. On the other hand, I do not. My role is to produce the show, whereas Mike is a resident subject matter expert. Together, we hope to inform, educate, and entertain frontline workers, their families, and the public regarding the realities of frontline work-related mental and behavioral health challenges. In today's episode, we have the honor of welcoming Michael Seguru, a retired police sergeant from California who stands as a beacon of inspiration and resilience for first responders everywhere. His tale is one that echoes in the silent spaces beyond the sirens and flashing lights, in the quiet aftermath where the real battles are fought. Michael's story, specifically rooted in the events of one harrowing night in December 2012, vividly highlights the intense and immediate pressures faced by first responders, where decisions made in mere moments can carry the weight of life or death, leaving enduring impacts on those who make them. Michael's raw and honest recounting of the legal and emotional aftermath of that critical incident unveils a side of public service rarely discussed but often endured. His candid portrayal of his fight with PTSD, the strain it placed on his family life, and the personal toll of a critical incident are stark revelations of the price paid by those who protect us. But it's not just a story of struggle. It's a chronicle of overcoming adversity. Michael's story took a pivotal turn when he reached out for help, a testament to the courage it takes to show vulnerability. His journey of recovery bolstered by his co-authoring of Relentless Courage, Winning the Battle Against Frontline Trauma, alongside Dr. Shauna Springer, has been nothing short of transformative, providing a path of hope and resilience for others to follow. Dr. Shauna Springer is a distinguished psychologist with a storied career in helping veterans and first responders heal from trauma. Doc Springer brings an essential perspective to Relentless Courage, Her expertise in forming strong therapeutic networks is a cornerstone of her practice and a testament to her belief in the healing power of connection. Dr. Springer's role was instrumental in the creation of this book, urging Michael to lay bare his journey, resulting in a work that bridges the gap between the reader and the visceral experiences of those on the front line. This episode is not just for those who have worn a badge, carried a hose, transported the sick and injured, or taken 911 calls. It is for anyone who stands behind them, the families, the friends, and the communities that they serve. It's a message of visibility, honor, and unity. You are seen. Your sacrifices are recognized. And you are not alone. Now, Michael Segrew shares his journey, a tale that might just be the catalyst for healing for some of our listeners. Thank you, and enjoy the show. Good morning, Michael. How are you, sir? Doing great. How about you guys? Good. It's morning for you, yeah. but afternoon for us. Yes. Can't complain. We keep making it is. from the West Coast. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I'm trying to get out of here actually. So once my my daughter's out of college, I'm I'm getting out of California. I'll tell you what, we'll switch houses. We'll just make it easy. We'll just rent each other's house. Yeah. <laughs> you can come. You can come do winter here, and we'll do winter where you're at. Yeah. Anytime you yeah. want. Anywhere is great. I'm not thinking of Michigan. I'm thinking like you know <laughs> Florida, like Tennessee, maybe Idaho, but Michigan's not on the list. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> shocker. <laughs> we'll get you here in the summer sometime yeah. to see how beautiful it could be. But yeah, I get it. I get it. So everybody uh, kind of heard who you are from us, but why don't you give your background? Who are you? What do you do? And where do you do it? It's a long story, so I'll try to make it uh, brief at this point. So I come from a family of law enforcement. And for me, I knew as a child, this is what I wanted to do. Right after college, I went straight into the Air Force as a second lieutenant. I was in security forces, which is basically a military police, anti-terrorism, force protection, air-based ground defense. I did that for six and a half years active duty, served all over the world, Middle East, South America, Europe, all over the U.S. Got out as a captain in 2004. I was already stationed back here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I'm from originally. And I went into civilian law enforcement for the Walnut Creek Police Department. Literally living my dream. I worked a bunch of different assignments from, you know, officer at first to FTO, detective, I was undercover on a state drug task force, got promoted pretty early on to sergeant with eight years on with the Walnut Creek Police Department. And I was involved in a very tragic incident, literally my second solo week as a sergeant. And that incident, it changed everything for me. Um, it, It literally led to a whole series of just other events and a downward spiral in my life. And I got to the point where literally I didn't want to be here anymore. I was suffering in silence. I literally was trying to kill myself on duty. And it was another fateful incident that literally saved my life. And that was my wake-up call. Um, And that's why I'm here today. So I'm now on the other side of the post-traumatic stress injury recovery. And I'm living proof that you can get better, that you can overcome this injury. And so I'm here to spread that word, to spread that message and to give people hope, but also for them to learn from my mistakes, because I made a lot of mistakes and I don't want people to make the same ones. Absolutely. That's very well said. I think, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't understand about what could happen as soon as that Sentinel event happens and then things start unraveling, they don't realize that once you're on the highway, it's really hard to find the rest stop or the turnaround. And so once you started going down that road, like you said, dealing with what you had to deal with, it's a very tough thing to crawl out of alone. It's nearly impossible. It is. And I thought I was alone. I mean, honestly, like when I was in the middle of it, I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought that the feelings I was having were abnormal and I didn't realize that it was actually normal. You know, all the things I was feeling, I was experiencing was a normal reaction to the horrific, abnormal things that we have to see and deal with on a daily basis. And I didn't realize how big the support network is out there, you know, that our brothers and sisters, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, dispatchers, they're going through it or they've been through it. And there's lots of people that can show you the way out. And so it's just amazing to learn what actual resources are out there that can help us. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give everybody some context. So first of all, like I said in the introduction, it's really important for you guys to go out there and read his book, Relentless Courage. It's a fantastic book that if you want to understand a little bit more of what it's like on the police side of things when they are being investigated for doing their job and to understand what the human goes through, it's a great book. If you're a culturally competent clinician or want to be, you got to read this book. If you're a fire chief, police chief, corrections, whatever boss, you got to read this book. If you want to be a peer supporter, you should probably read this book. My point is, is the culmination of a lot of great things where it's about your story, but it's amazing. And the human effect of the stress you went through is so common. So give everybody just the elevator version of the laundry list of things that unraveled since the event you were involved with that really spiraled you. So the event was a, it was a fatal officer shooting. And basically it was a guy with a butcher knife that was trying to kill a couple inside a condominium. And I was first on scene. Another officer uh, showed up right behind me. And when we confronted this individual, you know, trying to get to this couple, 
he then tried to kill us. And unfortunately, we had to take his life, not only to save our own lives, but to save the lives of the couple that were barricaded upstairs. And so that event, I call it my tipping point. Um, You know, I'd been involved in hundreds of traumatic incidents before this, but the problem is that I never dealt with them. I never decompressed. I never discussed them. I just bottled them up and they were stacking up internally. And I, I think of it kind of like a jar. You know, my jar was filling up and this shooting is what caused my jar to literally overflow. And so after the shooting, there was dual investigations going on, obviously from the district attorney, but also from our own agency, which is, which is all normal. But, you know, be a suspect and literally you are a suspect in a homicide until you're not. And so to go through that process where you're being interrogated, you're being interviewed, you've got attorneys, literally everything's on the line. That amount of stress alone is just, it's unimaginable. And you literally feel like a criminal. So imagine being a police officer and now you're going through a process where, you know, they're collecting your clothes, your your duty belt is evidence, you're getting photographs taken, you're checking your hands for gunshot residue just being interrogated by different people, all these different things. And so that happens. And I go home and I don't discuss it with my wife at the time. You know, I don't discuss what happened. And we have been ordered not to discuss it with anybody. You know, of course, I could have talked with my spouse because that's protected. Um, At that time, I didn't believe in peer support. I didn't believe in therapists or clinicians. So I didn't have those established relationships. And so I started dealing with it with alcohol because I was having constant nightmares. Literally, I couldn't fall asleep. And then when I finally did fall asleep, I was waking up with night terrors. I was exhausted. Um, Literally, I didn't want to be social. I I wanted to be in a room by myself. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. And so that literally started causing huge issues with my marriage. Again, because I didn't establish that healthy foundation in the beginning to talk about you know, the trauma at work. I always told myself that I would never bring the job home. I would never talk about it. And I thought that was protecting my family, but in reality, it was harming my family. And when I'd come home after a bad day, my family was walking around eggshells thinking it was something they did. They had no idea that maybe it was a horrific car, you know, car accident I went to that day or a suicide or a child abuse case. I mean, just all these things that we see as first responders day in and day out. And that's before uh, we actually, like, before anything huge happened. This is just daily operations. This is the oh, yeah. pressure cooker you're building leading up to having an unmanageable incident based on your abilities at the time. Absolutely. And then, you know, right away, we were also sued by the family. We unfortunately had to take a life and nobody wants to do that. And, you know, we talk about it, we plan for it. But in reality, And I think the public doesn't understand this, but most police officers are never involved in a fatal shooting. They just aren't. It's less than 1% of all police officers are involved in a fatal shooting. And so we are, and we've got these dual investigations, and now we're being sued for $15 million by the family members. And so now, I mean, literally, I just feel like the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I remember we had a critical incident debrief about two weeks after the shooting. And again, I messed up. I could have used that opportunity to open up and and talk about, especially as the leader, because I was the ranking person involved in this incident and start to talk about what was already happening in my life, the feelings I was having, the nightmares, the guilt of what I did. And I didn't do that. I mean, we literally used it as a fact-finding mission because we were so hungry to find out what happened and what other people saw and what they did. And again, we were so in such a hurry to go back to work because I didn't want anyone to think that something was wrong with me or, you know, I was weak or or any of these things. And so we literally went back to work as soon as we could. I think we were off for only two weeks after the shooting. And, and, you know, in in your head, it made sense. If I just go back to work, a, it's going to appear that I'm fine. I am fine. If I'm at work, I'm fine. Right. Avoidance almost. Absolutely. And I want people to understand, you know, part of this is gradual, you know, post-traumatic stress injury, It's not like an event happens, you wake up the next day and your whole world is just a disaster. You know, for me, it was a very gradual process. And so even that two weeks after this incident, I wasn't at a breaking point. I think if I would have opened up then and and kind of started this conversation of what was already going on, 
I would have dealt with it. You know, I would have addressed it. I eventually would have moved on, but I literally let this bottle up for four years. So this lawsuit's dragging on for four years. I actually end up a defendant in federal court in San Francisco. And this event that I want to forget, I can't. We're having depositions every single year. I've got to remember every finite detail because I'm going to be a defendant in court. I'm going to have to testify to every you know millisecond during this event, after this event. And so I couldn't forget it. You know, in that process of reviewing evidence photos and going through former statements and literally just reliving this year after year, I mean, it took such a toll. And it got to the point where my marriage was done. Now I'm fighting for custody of my daughter at the time, you know, my everything. And when my shooting happened, she was only, you know, a couple of years old. Imagine that. And, and now what I haven't addressed is that that incident it literally took away my feeling of invincibility that I always had in both the military and all my years in law enforcement. I mean, literally, I felt like I was untouchable, that nothing was ever going to take me out. And for whatever reason, you know, when that guy with the knife tried to kill me, I lost that feeling in literally a millisecond. And so I had this constant fear of dying. And yet I'm fighting for custody of my beautiful daughter. And I kept thinking like, She's not even going to remember who her dad was. She's not going to know how much I loved her. And then with this stress, my stepfather, who was my hero, he's the reason why I went into law enforcement. He gets diagnosed with stage four lung cancer at 58. He dies months later. I start getting repeated skin cancer diagnoses, which I know are a result of stress. And my drinking is getting out of control and literally gets to the point where I want to die. And so imagine this duality of like a fear of dying and then also wanting to die. And I know that may sound strange, but if you really think about it, I think people can relate to this. And it was just like, you know, I don't want to die, but I'm also tired of suffering. I just, I want this to end. It's a very human you know? paradox that people in your situation find. I don't think it's as misunderstood as it is like weird to express, but everybody gets it. You know, when they feel that way? Well, I think it's one of those things, too, when you go through this stuff. What what you're talking about, I mean, anybody that's gone through a lot of trauma, a lot of those things, they have those same feelings. Yeah. Like you talked about, you lost your invincibility. Well, all first responders, we walk around with that certain amount of invincibility. That's what gets us out of situations that most people run from is we walk into them going, all right, I'm going to handle this and we're going to walk back out. You walk into a fire, you walk into the situation you walked into, you have to have that certain amount of invincibility. That's what gets you there. And when you lose that, that's tough because now you're, you're questioning if I could do my job, you're worried about dying. But in the same sense, when you lose all that stuff, like you're talking about, yeah, you're like, I'm done. I don't want to be around anymore. Talk to a lot of first responders who have the same kind of thing. And really, I don't think people understand it. Like you talked about, I don't think people understand it because they look at it and go, well, how do you want to die? But you don't want to die. But what you're saying is almost like you want the pain to end and you're just, you're done with it. It's almost like you want to go to sleep and be done with it. Absolutely. And you know, for me, I didn't have an active plan to take my own life off duty or outside of work. But the way I justified it was that if I died in the line of duty, it would be okay because my family would be taken care of. I would always be remembered. So there's no way my daughter would ever forget who her dad was because I would be a hero. And so, you know, I put my officer safety, my tactics, my decision making, I put that aside and I purposely inserted myself into scenarios and situations where there was a high likelihood that something bad would happen. You know, unfortunately, by doing that at the, at the time, and I didn't realize it, but I also put some of my fellow officers in jeopardy as well because. I forced them into situations to cover me or to back me up when we should have waited, when we should have had a game plan, when we should have came up with a solution before rushing into this potentially dangerous or deadly situation. And, you know, I don't think people realize, but when you hear about that, like, troll car into a sound wall or into a tree and the police officers not wearing their, their seatbelt, you know, these things like this, some are tragic accidents, but how many are actually suicides? You know, and, and I don't think people really think about this, but or how many police officers say, you know what, today I'm not going to put on my bulletproof vest. I'm just going to go out there. You know, nothing's probably going to happen. But if it does, hey, I'm OK with that. How many firefighters say, you know, I'm going to go into this burning house without my oxygen 
where I'm not going to have all my safety gear on. You know, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to try to save somebody. But hey, if something happens to me, it, it was meant to be. It was in line it's like of duty. The weird romantic anti-hero thing that you see in movies, like oh, just, it's like lethal weapon. And we don't realize how destructive that is to the people around us. Like you're not just hurting yourself. You know, suicide by call is, you know, you get clipped on a call. You don't think your brothers and sisters are going to run in there and get you. And then they might get clipped. Right. So it's a lot of that of me cowboying up and running into a structure fire. He's got to come get me if something goes down. Or I'm with you. Or you're with me. You're in a leadership position. Right. If you say we're going in, I'm locked with you now. Right. That's the scary thing is you do see the guys who are taking risks. Because they're not leaving you. No. And they don't know where your head's at. So the other thing is like, it's almost like you hear this suicide by cop where people are like, I don't care anymore. I'm going to confront a police officer and let them do it for. It's kind of that same mentality of like lost. Suicide by the job. Right. Suicide by the job, suicide by cops, suicide by accident. Like those same people are having that same thought of, well, if a cop did it, at least I'm going to be remembered. Those people, including the police officers thinking that way, aren't in the right headspace at that time. They're having fleeting thoughts. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And the fact is, you know, we haven't talked about it yet. I know you probably talked about it on your show, but suicide is the number one killer for all first responders. And the suicide numbers far outnumber the line of duty deaths year over year. And, you know, even as good as the numbers are that are out there, they're way underreported, way underreported. I mean, I think they're at least three to four times higher. And, Absolutely. you know, I, I personally learn about suicides a lot of times that are never publicly put out there. Oftentimes, you'll see a fire department or a police department that will say, you know, officer so-and-so died suddenly. And that's it, right? And usually they're younger. They're, you know, they're 20, 30, 40 years old. And you think died suddenly. Okay, you know, what's going on with that? And and some agencies are are putting it out there now. They're, They're being better about getting this information out there. I know there's a balance between respecting privacy, honoring the family members, but I think it's also important to be real, to be honest, because this is something that shouldn't be covered up. When there's one suicide in the agency, there's much more likely to be follow-up suicides at that same agency or allied or surrounding agencies. And so, you know, again, the numbers, as good as they are out there, they're way, way underreported. And this is why we're having this discussion, because we're out there saving other people's lives every single day, right? And we train for that. We train to fight the bad guy as far as law enforcement. But how much time do we spend training for our biggest threat, which is ourselves? And we don't. We don't address it. We don't train for it. Agency chiefs don't want to acknowledge it. They want to just pretend like it's not real. They want to pretend like post-traumatic stress injury is just made up and people are faking it. And it's a real epidemic out there. And it's something that we need to fight head on. Absolutely. And I think that just talking about it more is going to break down that wall. And I think it's very, I don't want to say obvious, but it's not surprising to hear the things that you're saying. But I do want to get to something that is surprising. Like it's not surprising that you feel the way you feel after you were involved in a shooting. Even if you were acquitted and say it was a a, a lawful shooting, you still had to shoot someone. That sucks. You know, this wasn't like you were looking for problems. And then you got a stacking of all these things. These are all understandable things, but it's very hard for the brain to balance the fact when it's almost betrayed by others that are supposed to have our back. And one of the biggest things, which was a very small part of your book, is administrative betrayal. And so give us some background on what I mean by that. And you know what I mean. So I'll let you just tee that up and go ahead with it. You know, but first, before we go there, I want to bring up something that's directly related that we also don't talk about. So, and again, I, I'm going to say most, not all, but most first responders, in my opinion, have some form of childhood trauma. And let me qualify that by saying there's a scale on that. So it could be what I would say is on the minor end, which is maybe just a parent that works all the time, was never home. They love their children. Um, they're supportive, but they're just working so hard to provide they're not there. Or maybe an parent that's not emotionally expressive or affectionate. Or like in my case, I had a father who was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict. Or it could be on the more severe end of the spectrum, which is child abuse, you know, sexual abuse, mental abuse, all these things, right? So at a young age, we get exposed to this trauma. It actually makes us very resilient. It makes us good at overcoming adversity. It makes us decisive, makes us natural caretakers. 
it leads us to these careers in the military, as first responders, and it actually makes us very good at what we do. But like in my case, I never dealt with that. I never processed it. I literally just pushed it aside. I forgot about it. I literally forgot about it. And I'm, I'm living this great life. I'm this successful, badass first responder. I'm out there doing my thing, protecting and serving. And so the reason I bring that up, because it's directly related to admin betrayal. And so in my case, my admin betrayal started when, after my trial ended, and now I'm really at a very, very low point, and I'm really trying to die in the line of duty. It ended September 2016. About a month after that, I'm on duty. One of my best friends, turns out, tries to kill himself. He was a retired reserve officer, a Vietnam veteran. And I show up at the trauma center covered in blood, literally in and out of consciousness. They rush him off to emergency surgery. And I thought he was going to die. And I remember sitting there for hours in the hospital feeling this overwhelming sense of guilt of why didn't I do something to prevent this? Why didn't I see the signs? And all I could think about was my daughter. And what was she going to do? What was going to be the effect on her when I get killed in the line of duty? And so a month after that, on the anniversary of my shootings, when I finally got the strength and courage to ask for help, I mean, literally after four years of suffering in silence, I was ashamed, I was embarrassed, but I knew I had to do something. So I pulled out my cell phone, I called the on-duty watch commander, and I said, look, I I can't do this anymore. I cannot, I need help. And this is where my recovery process started. And initially, my department was supportive. They were giving me the resources I need. I was getting the time off. I was going to first responder support meetings. I was going to therapy. I went through a week-long program called the West Coast Post-Trauma Retreat. And and I'm going to tell you this specific story because it just, to this day, it still blows my mind. So I'm at this retreat. I'm making progress. Like My whole goal this whole time is to go back to work. Being a police officer is all I know. It's all I've wanted to do since being a child. And so I'm making progress. Things are happening. And while I'm at the West Coast Post-Trauma Retreat, we have like a a 90-day plan, a one-year plan, a three-year plan that we leave with. It kind of guides us in our recovery and it gives us some goals. Well, when I was at West Coast Post-Trauma Retreat, um, I basically realized that because of this fear of dying, I was like super obsessive about taking selfies with my daughter every time I had her because I didn't think she would remember who her father was. And I'm going through this horrible divorce. And literally one of my goals was instead of taking these photos to create a real lasting lifelong memories with my daughter instead of just these photos that really don't mean anything, right? Just give my daughter some real memories that she can hold on to. And so my plan was, this was in May, and I said, you know what? I'm going to take my daughter to Disneyland, just the two of us. And I'd never done this. I'd never even taken my daughter out of the county. And I said, we're going to go on Father's Day weekend, and we're going to create some real memories. And so I remember I picked her up from her mom because I've got, you know, half custody. I've got her bags packed. She's in the back seat and I hand her, she had these Mickey Mouse ears with a veil and her name stitched on it. And I gave it to her and I said, baby girl, we're going to Disneyland. Her face just like lit up. I mean, lit up. And I remember I posted the picture on Facebook. And at that time I was friends with everybody at my department on social media, my admin, everybody. And so we're driving down there. And I almost get to the hotel and I see a phone call coming to my cell phone. And I I recognize it's from the city of Walnut Creek, but I don't answer it. I'm like, it can just go to voicemail. And so it goes, but I'm OCD, I'm type A. So I listen to the voicemail right away. And it's a friendly message. It's just lingering in your head, right? I I gotta gotta hear it. (laughs) Yeah, because otherwise- We all know that because you're going to wonder for the next how many days what it's about. (laughs) Because if they did leave a message, it must not have been a big deal. They're probably whatever, no big deal. But no, there's that. Voicemail message right there. What is just waiting for you? Please press play. Exactly. <laughs> and so I remember this was a Thursday night. And so um, I get it. I listen to it. It's a friendly message. It's the HR director with one of my administrators. We'll just call him Captain Evil for the purposes of this discussion. <laughs> and uh, related to it, dog. Sound- yeah. yeah, right. And it, it's like at first, like, hey, we're just calling to check on you. We want to see how the West Coast post trauma retreat and see if there's anything you need and blah, blah, blah. And this is the end of their day. Good to hear from an employer. (laughs) You're like, what's the setup now? Yeah. 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 Right. And she goes, I'm here with captain evil and da, da, da. And so like, 
you know, I'm like, this sounds like friendly and there's no urgency. It's, it basically says, hey, if you get this by the end of today, call us. If not, you know, call us when you can. So I, I'm just like, whatever. I'm focused on my daughter. We get to the hotel. We book in. We're hanging out at the pool. The plan is we're going to Disneyland in the morning, right? So we're getting up early. We're getting Mickey Mouse pancakes across the street from the hotel and we're hitting the park. And so we're at breakfast and my phone rings again and I'm, it's a city number. I'm like, oh my gosh, what? Like, what is going on? But I, I don't answer it again. I'm sitting there, but I listen to it immediately. And this time it's Captain Evil. And his voice and demeanor is totally different. It says, you know, this is Captain Evil. It's such and such time. We tried to call you yesterday and you didn't answer your phone. And you're required to answer your phone business hours Monday through Friday, which, by the way, I've never heard of. Nobody told me that. And then he says, um, you know, we don't have any leave or vacation on the books for you. So we assume you're in town. Now, mind you, I did that Facebook post. So mm-hmm. everybody in the world knows where I'm at, right? I'm not trying to like make it a secret. Yeah. But the way his message was, is he was trying to like, you know, push me in a corner, maybe get me to lie. I don't know. He was trying to catch me up, right? Which is bullshit. But so now I'm like really stressed out. So I tell my daughter, I'm like, look, baby girl, I'm so sorry, but we got to go back to the hotel. I got to call my boss. Okay. But I promise we're going to go to the park. So we go back. I'm in this tiny hotel with my daughter. She's, you know, six and a half years old now, and I'm trying to keep her occupied. I call my Captain Evil up. And at first he's like, oh, hey, you know, I just want to call, see how things are going. And I'm excited. And then I'm like, sir, things are going great. I said, I got a great therapist. I'm going to these meetings. I went to West Coast and it was like West Coast post-trauma retreat. I said, it was life-changing. It was like magic. And I said, you know, I'm making progress. And, he's, and eventually gets to the point where he's like, well, when are you coming back to work? And I said, uh, Captain, I don't know. I said, uh, I can tell you that I am coming back. That's my goal. I don't have an exact date for you, um, but I'm going to come back as soon as I can. And then the conversation turns to retirement, something I never thought of, something I didn't want. And he basically tells me, you know, after saying, Hey, have you ever thought about, you know, retiring? And I told him, I said, no, you know, I haven't. I said, that that's not my plan. Like I'm coming back. And he was like, he basically tells me that, you know, if you decide that that's something you want to do, we can make this painless for you. You know, we can make it, make it very easy for you. And I was like, well, think in my mind, like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Right. But I, I said, sir, you know, I appreciate that, but it's not necessary. Like I'm going to get better. So anyways, I get through that. Now I'm just pissed and i can't right. just shit on, your on my daughter yeah i mean the yeah. whole weekend i'm stressed i'm thinking about like what is going on where did this come from like what are they talking about because up to this point they've been supportive and now all of a sudden they're talking about retirement and this is where i realized i was just a number filling a position like all those years of hard work and dedication it didn't matter they either wanted me back right now like today doing the job or they didn't want me at all and so I get through the weekend, I come home, um, I think it was Sunday night, and then on Tuesday in the mail, I get this certified letter on official letterhead from another lieutenant saying, we understand that you may have been out of the area and per policy, blah, 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 you're required to submit leave and you're required to notify us and da, da, da. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about, dude? Like, I'm in the same state. I drove a few hours Disneyland on Father's Day weekend, right? And, and so now I'm just livid. And so now I'm like, you know what? F this. And I got an attorney. Like the whole time I didn't get a, a work comp attorney because I'm like, I don't, they're giving me resources. I'm going back to work. And now like you're in the system and it was going well. And then all of a sudden, like, yeah, like the yeah. second thought, like, okay, well, we finished all that stuff. You should be better now. We've well, decided. Well, not only that, but how you, you made a huge step in progress. That one phone call just knocked all that progress yeah. right back. You know what I mean? Now it you're passing over stuff, you know? Like, Absolutely. That's what people, I think sometimes don't realize in the higher up positions is that one phone call from HR and that captain erased how much time and effort that you put in to get yourself to that position where you're like, I want to take my daughter to Disneyland on father's day weekend. And you were happy about it. I wasn't on light duty. I was right. literally no. on, like getting medical treatment and focused on my recovery. And, you know, there's this conception out there that if you're out on injury, you have to be miserable and you can't live life. And that's bullshit, you know, especially when you're recovering from post-traumatic stress injury, 
you know, I hadn't lived life for the last four years. Yeah. And part Disneyland of my recovery is probably the is, place you go when you need a little happiness with a six year old to get away. Right. Yes, exactly. And, yes. and that's what just blows my mind. And, and after that, it, you know, it started a series of other things and it got to the point where in August, I made the decision that I was going to medically retire. I'm just like, I, I can't do this. Like I, I can't, there's no way I can go back to that job. There's no way I can go back to this agency, but was it, here's was it where steeped in like the, the combination of everything, just like an effort. Like, you know what? I just, I can't deal with all this, knowing how people actually feel, knowing how you don't have my back in reality. I just don't feel comfortable. Is that like what it's rooted in? Yeah, it was, the, it, it was the feeling of abandonment. Um, and it brought back that childhood trauma where I never dealt with, you know, my father and that abandonment. And here I thought I found this new family, my blue family that had my back to the fullest, that was always going to be there for me, you know, right? Because I'm out there putting my life on the line every single day for complete strangers. And then I find out that my agency wants nothing to do with me, that they want to get rid of me, that they're not going to support me. And they're going to make my life miserable. And it, it got to the point where I just said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. Like, there's no way I can put on the uniform and go out there and do the job and know that when the next big incident happens, you're not going to have my back. You're not going to be there for me or my family when I need you most. Here's the most effed up part about this whole thing is that when I finally made the decision to retire, as hard as that was, as difficult as it was, and as scared as I was, that's when a few weeks later, I get another phone call from a different captain informing me that I was the subject of an eye investigation for something that supposedly happened a year and a half earlier. Oh, by the way, that could result in possible criminal charges that violated about like 15 different city policies and not only would get me fired, but it would cause me to lose my retirement and possibly face jail or prison time. And so at that point, I literally wanted to kill myself. I literally, when I got off that phone, I wanted to take my gun and shoot myself. And thank God I used my resources and I pulled out my phone. I called out the peer director of the West Coast Post Trauma Retreat, talked to him for two hours and he talked me down and he brought me back. And I was able to have to get another attorney. So I have a work comp attorney. I have an LDF attorney. And this bullshit investigation held up my retirement for another eight or nine months. And so imagine the amount of stress that I'm under, literally facing, losing everything, everything. And that was what literally pushed me over the edge. And in my opinion, it's not the horrific things that we see and deal with on the streets or on the battlefield. It's when our family, our blue family, our red family, when they abandon us, when they leave us out on an island, that's when most first responders take their own lives. Understatement of the year. Yeah. Yes. So do you think that the motivation behind that, like it, it's hard for people that haven't maybe read your book and you and I have spent some time talking. So like, I, I know what kind of guy I'm talking to. People that are just listening for the first time don't know you. So they may be like, well, this jerk probably did something. He's probably hiding it. He got investigated. He must have done something. So convince me you're not a jerk. And they, like, tell me, give us some more context to how petty that is in that situation. So in this situation, um, ironically enough, this officer, he had been investigated and it had been proven that he lied in like, I think it was like 32 different police reports. Like it was all over the news. He should have been fired. He wasn't. And I, and honestly, the reason why he wasn't fired is because it was found out that basically the evidence management system wasn't as up to par as it should have been. And that if they fired this guy, he would be able to come back and get his job back because they would expose the faults and the, the basically the, the evidence system and find out that, and, and other officers, not intentionally we're doing things, but just that there wasn't really a QC process to to check some of these things, like a safeguard. You mean and administrative so, failure? They didn't want to be yeah. embarrassed and show that the whole operation's got huge flaws? Got it. it. Exactly. And so somehow this guy keeps his job, right? And so months later, um, he's in a courtroom or something like that. And he's, he's involved in an incident. I wasn't involved in an incident, but he and another supervisor – and he wrote a supplemental report, which contradicted this other supervisor. 
And in, in court, he basically said that I told him to change his report, but he never changed it, by the way. And then I said, I approved this report and that's what, so I was like, what, what is this even about? So this officer who's a proven liar says that I told him to change something, but he didn't change it. And I approved the report. Like it didn't make any sense. Like it was such a bullshit. So there was no adults around to go, hang on a minute. Why do I have an investigation going on? And another guy who's trying to retire when this guy's like, it tells me you got no control over what's going on in your own house. And then you're threatening people. Like, what are we doing here? Well, it's look, look over here. Don't look over. Here. Yeah. 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 Well, I know part of it was because this officer that should have been fired, he was on like secret double square, you know, probation where if he effed up anything else again, he was going to be fired. And so I think he realized that he screwed something up and then he tried to blame somebody else for it because he knew if he told the truth, he'd be fired. And so, you know, that's the thing is this guy shouldn't even be in law enforcement like this guy. And he's still a police officer. Um, he, he moved out of the state. He's not working in California now, I found out. Um, but it's just like, so you're going to support this guy, a liar, who it was proven that he lied in like 30 something police reports. I mean, it was just. Blew I get the my due diligence mind. of like accepting like, OK, let's hear the guy out to like grab the uh, the statements. But like then to drag out this other thing is just incredible. So yeah, I wanted you to kind of give that context as to it wasn't like, you know, Mike's here lying to us trying to get one over. Like, no, he got he got a part of a system that another guy was in trouble and he got dragged down with him. That sucks. So you go through this process, you're you're done with it. You're done with it. Man, and and okay, you leave. You leave all that stuff. Now what? It's not like okay, well, I left, I feel better. I was still embarrassed and ashamed. Um, you know, when I finally retired, I didn't tell any people what was going on. I didn't tell them why I retired. Um, of course, the administration knew, but I had cut all ties with everybody at that agency because I was so embarrassed. Honestly, I was still so embarrassed. Even, you know, after going through this work and and doing all these things, I just, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted to go go away, live my quiet life, and that's it. And um, things changed um, about a year after I retired. So I retired in the summer of 2018. Um, a year after that in 2019, a podcast host, and I'd never been on a podcast. I never shared my my story publicly. He reached out to me. He was big into fitness. I was into fitness and he was a former police officer. Asked if I'd be on a show. And I said, you know, I, I, I'm honored you'd ask me, but I'm not interested. No, thank you. And thankfully this guy honestly kept harassing me in a good way and got me to the point where I couldn't say no. And he's like, look, I'm going to drive the two and a half hours to you. You name the spot. I just need an hour of your time. And so finally I did agree to do it. And this is what changed everything for me because um, I remember I met with this guy in the back of a Mimi's cafe. You know, I didn't know him. I thought we were going to have breakfast, get to know each other. But he told me, he's like, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm in a huge hurry. I've only got an hour and I've got to get out of here. So we're just going to do this. And he had laptops set up, a camera, headphones. I sat down and he started asking me questions. And I just answered from the heart. I didn't worry about how is this going to sound? Like, let me craft my answer. I just answered from the heart, you know, vulnerably, truthfully. Um, and that got aired a couple weeks later. And again, I was, I was so anxious and nervous thinking, man, when this gets out there, people are going to find out and they're going to, send me these hateful messages and they're going to look down upon me. And, and that didn't happen. I started getting messages from all over the world, from the UK, from Canada, Australia, the U S on how my story was their story. And these, these strangers, right? My brothers and sisters started sharing their stories with me. And this is where I really realized that, you know, I'm not alone, that there's so many other people out there just like me going through the same things. And, and that was like this huge burden came off my shoulders and the guilt and the shame slowly started to go away. And that led to podcast after podcast after podcast. And eventually that led to speaking um, all across the nation to, you know, firefighters, police officers, military members. And so I never envisioned or planned for any of this. It just, it just happened. Um, now, and I truly that? believe that everything happens for a reason. After all that, you know, you, you, you talked about how you're 
administration dealt with this and and how they dealt with you and after all that how how was the reaction from the members you used to work with in that administration after you're now out here talking about all this stuff openly stuff that should have been talked about 10 years ago and you know you said i i don't want anything to do with this department you know that type of thing and you know I, i've noticed in a lot of departments where the administration maybe is how you described but the members are all tight because we're, we're all kind of locked in this thing together almost against the administration or in spite of the administration. How was it with the, with your members that you worked with, like the boots on the ground type after all this stuff came out and you talked openly about it? Like how was their reaction, you know, a after that? I'd say it's mixed to be honest with you. I mean, I, I would love to tell you that everybody opened their arms up and was supportive and welcoming, but, um, and there was a lot of people that were, but there's also people out there still to this day that treat me like I have a plague or like a cancer and um, they can't even look at me. They don't want to be associated with me. And it's, I used to get so angry about that type of stuff, but what I've realized is that, well, number one, I don't judge people like I used to, but number two, I realized that people are dealing with their own crap and a lot of people haven't acknowledged it and they don't want to acknowledge it. And they know that if they acknowledge mine, they may have to acknowledge their own BS. And, and so I pray for them. You know, I hope that at some point they realize, you know, the damage that they're causing to themselves, to their family members, to their loved ones. But as far as the administration, you know, I haven't heard, I've heard from sergeants and lieutenants, but, you know, the actual, I would say main players in this, I've never heard from. Um, I've never gotten an apology, nothing at all. And ironically enough, there's a new chief that took over the agency. I don't know this chief. I've never met him, um, but I've sent him interviews i've done i've sent him the links to the book articles on the book he has a copy responded. of the book yeah <laughs> i'm not he hasn't even responded like it's ridiculous like, how do you not just like, reach out to a member who's 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 clearly it's ironic because i you know i speak all over the country right so i'm in california i've spoken virginia um florida you know all over the midwest but yet you know they would never have me come speak at that agency even though you know 80% of the people I worked with aren't even there anymore. It's a totally different department. It's a totally different chief. But you would think like if you're taking over a department, you would want to find out about the history. Maybe you would read an internationally best-selling book, right? That is not just some like fluff piece, but is actually like, you know, saving lives around the world. Maybe you would spend five or six hours and like read this book just to kind of find out what happened. Maybe you would like, send a reply on a message that you receive, but not even a single reply. I mean, it's just like, really, dude? I think the other part that, and I know we've talked about it on here before, and you touched on it earlier on, a lot of the cities, a lot of administrations, and a lot of bean counters, a lot of everybody needs to realize you can have the nicest cars, you can have the nicest equipment, you can have the nicest police stations, firehouses, whatever it may be. Your number one resource is you take care of the people. You take care of the people, everything else falls into place. And a lot of the departments that I see that have the happiest employees with the biggest morale are the ones that the employees are put first, no matter what. Like, you know, you're sick, your kid's sick, hey, go home, family first, the job second. And I think that's what we need to get to is the realization of you can have the shiniest fire truck out there. That's great. But if the people riding in it want to kill themselves, how good is this place? We need to stop getting away from first responders isn't a business, you know, and it's all about, you know, how much money this costs, how much money this costs, how much money this costs, how much money does it take to do a wellness program for your department? You know what I'm saying? How much money does it take to take care of the people who take care of everything? That's where our money needs to start being a little more allocated. I'm not saying, you know, nice equipment and that those things aren't important, but supporting your employees, the rest of the machine doesn't run. I don't think there's anything more important because if your employees are not happy or your, your employees are not being taken care of or your employees aren't being supported, a lot of times, a lot of us just feel like a number on a page and it's just plug and play. I think a lot of places know that if you walk away, there's five people who are waiting to take your spot. 
There used to so, be. Now, now, well, have, now we have a yeah, not anymore. Now we, now we have anymore. a shortage, but for a long time, <laughs> that's that's what it was. Right. It was, you know, oh, well, we'll just move on. We'll get somebody else. And you're right. The, the current bosses came up in that where it's like, I'll just get somebody else to do it. It's like, well, no, no you won't. But, <laughs> nobody else can. But that's the thing is I think we need to start looking. Like you talked about, it's the family. Take care of them like you take care yeah, of your exactly. family. They're not your employees. They're your family. On my crew, there, there's times where like, hey, I got to call in sick two days in a row. And you're like, then call t- call in sick two days in a row. Well, I don't want to get in trouble. You're like, listen, I'm not getting you in trouble. Family comes first as far as I'm concerned. You go take care of your family because once your family's taken care of and you come back to work, your head's where I need you to be, not coming to work and your kid's sick at home. Yeah. And I think we need to start getting more towards that. You you take care of the person. They're not an employee. They're a person. That's where I think we're starting to change it. And like your book, talking about your story, because you're influencing the people who are going to be leaders down the road. That's where we change this stuff. We can't change what's going on today, right now, or in the past. All we can do is learn from our past and not repeat the history to make it better for the generations down the road. And I, just like you said, talking about this book, reading your book, those people are going to read it. And the people who got a hold of you from all across the world, they are now at some point going to have those positions and they're going to go, you know what? This was screwed up. I'm not going to do that in my place. And that's where I think what you do and what you talk about and the, and the book and even how the book is written, where you tell your story and then the doctor comes in and explains all of the stuff that's never been done before. And so now people get to understand this. It's not just your story, but they understand why things happened the way they did. And that brings that education to these next generation of leaders. So we don't have what happened to you happen again. Yeah. Th- and it that's was, amazing. Yeah, it, it truly. And I actually, Michael, we're going to steal this idea from you. So let me give you a little context. Are we listening? The book is written where Michael talks, gives his feelings, opinions, and background. And then Doc Springer, the co-author of this book comes on and gives her reflections from a clinician standpoint to say, this is what Michael said. This is why he felt that way. This is the human being response to these types of things. And it was a perfect connection of not just a story, but a story that another person can go, yo, this human's feeling this because X and I could relate to you. I can't relate to shooting another person, but when a clinician comes on and explains to me the human emotion of going through a traumatic event and what it does to their brain, body, and feelings, that I can relate to. So uh, give us some more background on Doc Springer, because we're totally stealing your idea for our episodes. We're actually going to interview people and then have a clinician comment on it. It's going to be great. Thanks for the idea. So, yeah, <laughs> Doc Springer, uh, yeah. amazing, amazing woman. So the, I'll, I'll just give you the quick backstory of this book, because again, it's not anything that I planned or envisioned. And Right before COVID, I didn't know Doc Springer. Um, she's a clinical psychologist, Harvard graduate. She had written three books back then. She's written more since. Um, but she just reached out to me on LinkedIn to say, hey, you know, I want to have a conversation with you to see, learn more about you, see the work that you're doing in the mental health field, and let you know about what I'm doing. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's have a phone call. So she calls me up, and she tells me about her work that she's doing with stellate ganglion block which is a medical procedure to treat the physical symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And uh, we talk about that in full detail in the book. And then afterwards, I tell her my story. And after that, she pauses and she just, she asked me point blank, have you ever thought about writing a book on this? And I kind of laughed and I said, well, you know, I've briefly thought about this. I've been asked this before, but I said, honestly, with post-traumatic stress injury, I don't really have the the drive, the focus, the concentration, the patience like I used to have. And I don't think I can get a project like that done. And so we just leave the phone phone conversation at that. A couple weeks later, she hits me back up and she says, look, she says, my work as a clinical psychologist for the VA, Veterans Affairs and TAPS, which is Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, she said, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of trauma stories, but your story is just sticking with me. She said, I I just can't stop thinking about it. And she said, your story is going to save countless lives. And she said, I want to do this book with you. I want to make this happen. And literally right then, without even meeting her in person, I said, let's do this. Like I knew in my heart, she was the right person to do this with. And so COVID happens. And then 
literally we did this whole project for the first almost a year just via zoom like every single week we were doing two hour zoom meetings and it evolved into this project and doc springer i mean not only is she a culturally competent clinician but she truly gets it she truly understands us as both military members and first responders but she is a brilliant brilliant woman a phenomenal gifted writer and i'm so blessed to have her in my life to do this project and you know this project it took a toll to have to go back and relive this but this book is living proof of the collaboration between a culturally competent clinician and a first responder because before and after every session we would talk she would check in with me. you know we would talk about what was going on and we had a relationship then and we still have it today i just talked to her yesterday where I can call, text her anytime, and she can do the same with me. And we can have fully open, transparent, vulnerable conversations with each other. And that's what is required, you know, to have that trust to where you can share these things with somebody. And it shows the path, the healing path to overcome this injury, because it is an injury. I want to get rid of that word disorder. And, and this needs to be relabeled as an injury, because there's no doubt it's a physical injury to the brain. And you can heal. And there's things you can heal, exactly. And there's, yeah. you know, different things for everybody. There's not one magic thing that works for everybody. But in this book, we talk about a lot of different options, things that I've done, things that have worked, things that haven't worked. Um, we have tons of resources in the back of the book for people. Like you said in the interview, there is no other book I know of in the world that has this structure. And and truly it's owed to Doc Springer. I mean, she's the one that had this vision and had this idea. And so again, I just, I can't speak highly enough about her. Um, she is just a courageous, brave, phenomenal human being. And, and I will tell you too, in this book, she shares some of her own personal trauma. She shares some of her own life experience. And that that's what makes this so personal for both of us. Yeah, I, I was, I thoroughly enjoyed First of all, since you're both authors and you both read the book and the audiobook, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But listening to Doc Springer, number one, she's got one of those really cool, calming voices and tones and tenors where you can listen all day and you're like, man, this is calming, very relaxing. But yes. she does this, she also does this amazing explanation where she defines the word doc. And she's not talking about PhDs, MDs, DOs, psychology. She's not talking about that. She goes on a way to describe what doc means to first responders and military, where we bestow a, a name on you as doc as a healer and we trust you. And the, her essay on that in your book, I'm going to call it an essay because it really is a beautiful essay that I want people to hear or read or whatever. It, it really sums up what we need in our healers in this peer support world and in our support world for our clinicians like her. So if nothing else, you got to read that part in the book or listen to her say, she needs yeah. a YouTube video out of that. It was like perfect. And it needs to be sent to every culturally competent clinician to share with ones that are not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yes. All right, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael Segru, for joining us in the Minds in the Frontline podcast. It was truly an honor. We hope everyone enjoyed this episode. We have more great content coming out soon. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds on the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.